He returned to Michigan State University in 2006 and is now a professor at Michigan State University. He divides his time between service at the Diagnostic Center for Population and Animal Health, teaching veterinary <laughs> students, and continued research on reproductive diseases in beasts of all kinds. Let's welcome Dr. Edmund. Thank you very much. So I can't even begin to tell you how intimidating it is to uh, follow uh, Corey Brown, not once, but, uh, but twice in this meeting. And I even, I went to Ethiopia and wouldn't you know it, I thought I was as far as possible I could get. And, and, and I followed Corey Brown <laughs> in Ethiopia when we were uh, doing some, some work there. So uh, it is always an honor to be on the same program, but you know what? We're gonna talk about something completely different. So um, what I'd like to do today is to talk a little bit about uh, some of the research I've been doing, but really rather than talk about the what um, and, the, and, the, and the who, all of the, the going through a, a list of lesions, I kind of want to give you the why of wh why we're looking at reproductive disease, particularly in zoo and wildlife um, uh, species. So to do that, I want to kind of back up and give you a little bit of history of where this all came from. And it's interesting because this is a little bit of a dated slide because I think we're up to about 26th or 27th anniversaries for these. But when I started thinking about this, this is the 25th anniversary uh, really of the Wildlife Contraception Center and the Reproductive Patholo or the Reproductive Management Center, which is a part of the AZA. And it's uh, dedicated to understanding and developing tools to enhance reproduction of endangered uh, zoo species and wildlife species. It started out 25 years ago as just a task force and it has developed into a group that looked at contraceptives and then they discovered, you know what, contraceptives aren't the whole story and it has since evolved into a comprehensive look at reproduction in, um, in zoo and wildlife animals. This was also about the time of the first International Conference on Fertility Control in Wildlife. And it's interesting that the crossover between those two um, groups of experts is really pretty extensive. And so the same philosophy, the same tools, the same principles really apply across the board in all of these species. But and, and another uh, notable 25th anniversary was, uh, this was when Dr. Linda Munson, who was my mentor, my PhD mentor, um, and a mentor in a whole lot of other ways, but. Uh, she began studying the effects of contraceptives because contraceptives were just beginning to be used in zoo and wildlife species. And all of her early work there looking at some diseases, and I'll talk about some of those later on, um, led ultimately to the development of a, of a, of a surveillance program. And so um, I can still remember the day that she called and said, you're in charge of it. And she shipped me the whole you know, sea crate full of uteruses. And so I've got that whole sea crate of uteruses now at Michigan State University, and it's an honor to continue that reproductive health surveillance program. But I want to back up too and say a couple other things were going on back then. This was a time, an interesting time in the zoo community, where a particular director who happened to be at the Detroit Zoo, Steve Graham, was euthanizing healthy Siberian tigers because they were surplus to the genetic pool. There is not enough room in zoos for all of the tigers. And his solution to that was very scientific in that they were euthanized. They were humanely euthanized, but they were killed. And this was a huge um, public relations disaster, I'll say. Uh, it was a huge controversy throughout the zoo world, et cetera. And it ended up changing. The Detroit Zoo actually shifted completely over to we have one of the most animal welfare to animal rights oriented directors of the, in the zoo community now who has actually alienated the whole zoo community because of his completely opposite perspective. But interestingly, this was a time when there were many hoofstock at the, um, at, the, at, the, at the zoo. And if you go to the University of Michigan Museum or you go to Michigan State University, you will find the most fabulous collection of antelope mammal skulls. But what you can do is you can pick out the, the ones that came from this era because there's a hole in the skull on every one of those, right in that one characteristic spot right there. 
And I know the ex-Marine who placed all of those shots. And he was an excellent, uh, excellent shot. And so none of those animals suffered, but that's a very different era than what we're used to in the zoo world. But this was when a young veterinarian whom you might know started his career. And this is a much younger me bleeding an elephant ear back then. Let me go back even further in history though and talk about where population control really started because that's what we were talking about here is population control. You know, not population stop anything, but population control. How do we get the right number of animals? And animal agriculture has always depended on this. And we rely on various tools throughout history uh, for fertility, castration, separation, your standard farming tools, things that my, my, my grandfather taught me on the farm. Um, ancient women, you know, even back then, they had their own plans, their own arrangements, and so they learned quickly that fermented acacia has contraceptive qualities, much to the chagrin of their husbands, I am sure. Um, but population control took on all kinds of different means in wildlife. And so this is one of our previous presidents uh, taking care of population control, doing his part, right? So this is a leopard from Africa and one of his big Africa trips. But anyway, so we've grown a ways now and we've started looking at other methods to control population. And this is what we would consider contraception. So population control, you know, by gunshot, we don't really consider that contraception. Um, but we're looking maybe at a more scientific management of species. And the goal here is sometimes a little bit, a little bit uh, subtle in that we want to maintain genetic diversity in a population and how to best do that. We want to avoid hybrids, we want to avoid inbreeding, we want to keep overrepresented individuals um, uh, appropriately represented. There are some lion pairs that just do it better than others. And so what are you gonna do about that? We got into control that. And aggression control, because we all know testosterone is the root of a lot of problems in this world. And so we do need to control that as well. But if you think about it, it's really important. Probably all of those are important reasons, but in the current zoo world and the zoo environment and our public relations issues, that really when it starts to come down to it, it's an issue of animal welfare. And you start out with two tigers, and before you know it, you've got far more tigers than you can fit into your zoo. And so this becomes a major issue, and we need to control, hopefully, those first two tigers. And so we've got a lot of tools at, at, at hand. And so a lot of you guys in the, I don't know, have we got any Toxpath folks who showed up so for the, for the wildlife session? Hey, there we go. We got one in the back. All right, good. So this is our you know, classic development of a drug you know, through to, uh, through to completion takes, you know, 15 years, and I don't know how many millions and millions of dollars to do that. Well, what I love about the zoo world is, oh, not, is moving backwards, um, no, we're going to go forward, is that we just put a big old X through all of that in the zoo world, because what we do is use a lot of the tools at our disposal. We go get a good contraceptive, or what we think might be a good contraceptive, and hey, we just go stick it in an animal. <laughs> And uh, that's basically our drug development program. Um, we do have, you know, some technical things. We've got to use a, an in investigational new drug license, or we use it as a listed drug, or extra label drug use, or minor use, minor species. And you know, when you're talking about a, you know, a Saudi goitered gazelle, well, yeah, that's kind of like a goat, right? That's a that's a mum. Anyway, so we do get away with it. But the problem is that essentially all of that pre um, distribution testing that we do in for other drugs for human drugs for instance or or food animal drugs is not done in the zoo world we do it all after the fact so this is where the, my reproductive our reproductive um, uh, management center and the archive the reproductive um, surveillance program is critical because we need to look at these drugs very critically from the first time they're injected to look for adverse effects now let me back up again and talk about some of the goals of contraception. So we want to certainly prevent pregnancy, but we also want to maintain the potential for fertility, at least in the population, if not in that individual. Because all of our curators, those who are making the management decisions, are always telling us, not now, but maybe later. So they, they'll never say, because if it's a not now or ever, that's an easy decision. 
That's called either culling or castration. But in zoos, the managers need to develop and maintain a genetic pool. And to do that, this means increasing the population size because each animal is a repository of that portion of the genetic pool. And we want to maintain that population as long as possible. We want to breed animals as late in life as possible. And like the minute before they die, we want them to breed and pass on those genes to the next generation. And if we could figure out how to time that perfectly, that's the ideal thing. And that's what the curators routinely ask us to do. And that's how you would maximize genetic diversity and minimize population size. Because again, think about those tigers. We want to minimize the amount of space in a zoo uh, that's being used by animals. And the only way you can do that is with contraception. So I'm going to go through some of the methods that we have used. So certainly gonadectomy is, a, is an age-old one that works really well. Castration, ovario, hysterectomy. But these are end of the road, right? These animals are not recoverable. We may be able to do some kind of genetic banking, all of this um, artificial uh, um, uh, insemination or embryo transfer, uh, embryo freezing, uh, assisted reproduction techniques are all part of that, but they're all very difficult and challenging in the zoo and wildlife species that we work with. So there are other methods that we can do, tubular blockage uh, or uh, just messing up with the plumbing, um, hysterectomies, tubal ligations, vasectomies, epididymectomies. Those were my favorite techniques in, in, uh, in, uh, in practice because you just lop off the bottom of the testicle. It doesn't require a lot of surgical skill, which tells you why I'm a pathologist today, right? <laughs> so, um, but it works really well in wildlife species where you need to absolutely minimize your, your handling time for those animals. Bass plugs were a really interesting attempt where actually we would um, anesthetize an animal. And in this case, we use chimps. I think I've got some photos of us doing it here on a chimp, or that's me doing an epididymectomy. Here's a the vas plug, where we would isolate the vas and we would inject essentially bathroom clock, caulk into medical grade bathroom caulk <laughs> into the vas and then put it in there. But if you've ever, I mean, the, the, think about the worst possible human patient and make that tenfold and you've got a chimp. Because the chimps would wake up and they would immediately rip open that surgery, grab their vas in their hand, pull that little plug out and throw it at you. <laughs> And then now you've inflammation, hopefully, is going to be your friend and at least make them infertile. Um, so this was, again, my surgical technique here. What I would do then, the next time we tried it, I sewed all of their fingers together. And then I put sutures all over their back and all over their body. So by the time they got their hands undone, and they got all the sutures out of the rest of their body, then hopefully they had left their vast surgery site. But even when it worked well, it seemed to fail in chimps, and we don't really know why it failed so miserably in chimps, but it didn't work anyway. So these are theoretically reversible if they work, um, but essentially, if you think about the, you're breaking down the blood testis barrier in most of these, and so you're gonna end up with inflammatory issues, you're gonna end up with maybe an autoimmune response to sperm and infertility anyway. So another one is steroid hormones. And this is actually where we started off in the zoo community using MGA, which is a progestin. Depro-Provera might be another drug that you might be familiar with. Estrogens are also used, and essentially in human birth control pills, estrogens are a component of that. But we found historically that these estrogens um, and, uh, usually have much higher side effects and much more problems in these species. Androgens are another drug that we've attempted. We've tried it in a few species but I've already told you that testosterone does bad stuff and usually it continues to do bad stuff even when you um, use it uh, pharma, pharma, pharmacologically. And the latest, greatest drug that we're really using quite heavily now are the GnRH and GnRH analogs. And so there are antagonists to GnRH, and I won't go into all of the pharmacology, but overall these are too expensive, short acting, and oftentimes do permanent damage to the pituitary hypothalamic uh, gonadal axis. But there are agonists, and we may be uh, uh, used to seeing these because they're actually quite commonly used in, in human medicine for prostatic hyperplasia, prostatic cancer, um, and, and, and other things. And this actually is, is a, has been a very effective drug in many, many species. And one of the challenges, though, is that when we use it, 
there is an acute stimulation of the gonadal axon um, uh, axis, and there is a very short-term hyperfertility, and lots of pregnancies have occurred during that little window of time there, which is a problem. Uh, but as long as we manage that little window of time, it has actually proven to be a very effective contraceptive. What we've had issues with is reversal because they are marketed, say, as a six and a nine month long period of, of contraception. We've had tigers going out six years, seven years after that's been removed. And so we're actually doing some active research on that. Essentially, all of the animals return to fertility, but much later than we would have liked. But it works in males and females. So finally, a little bit of potty parity here. The males and the females are getting their equal share. Immunocontraception is another one that has been used quite extensively. Zona pellucida vaccine, it's made from a porcine product. Short term, it's used to block fertilization. Uh, it's used quite heavily in African elephants and uh, wild populations in, you know, in the deer and uh, around University of Michigan. There's a, a wild deer population, so they're using immunocontraception to, to bring that down. Generally reversible and the cycle is maintained. It does have an effect on season, so oftentimes these animals will cycle throughout the year because they don't have pregnancy to stop the cycle. And so sometimes that can be a problem with males aggravating the females um, because they're constantly in season. And long-term use can lead to ovarian failure. We did do a project to look at the effects on the, on the uterus, and in our, our short study and small study that we were able to do, we didn't see any damage to the uterus in long-term use. But the, the, the hallmark, the standard has always been MGA. And this is actually where uh, Linda Munson first became involved because they started using MGA quite extensively in tigers and it worked great. Except all of a sudden, uh-oh, tigers started to become sick and die. And one of the things is that this, um, characterized in this photo, cystic endometrial hyperplasia, pyometra, very, very, very common in big cats and canids when they were treated with these progestins. We would get polyps that would obstruct. This is from a, 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 a lion. But most damaging, I think, to the reputation for MGA was when this is a mammary gland, we would get nasty, nasty mammary adenocarcinomas. And these would met to the lungs, they would, and, and to other organs, and oftentimes kill. And so we ended up backing off. In fact, some of the uh, curators refused to use MGA at all. But in, when we started to really study it, look at the data, we found that you could effectively use MGA for two years, have a pregnancy in between, and then effectively use it again for another two years. So while it's not a permanent contraception, it's one that could at least decrease the numbers of cycles that a female would have in her lifetime. An interesting exception to this big cat rule were the jaguars. Because the jaguars would get cystic endometrial hyperplasia, pyometra, but our data showed a really interesting um, increase in endometrial carcinomas. So the other cats weren't getting carcinomas, but jaguars were getting carcinomas. And even scarier was the ovarian carcinomas that they would get. And these ovarian carcinomas, something like 40% of the female um, jaguars in captivity die of ovarian carcinoma, which is an astronomical number for one, one lesion. And so when you start looking at that, though, they would also get mammary carcinoma as well. What was interesting is if they were on contraceptive, it actually enhanced their, the likelihood that they were going to get um, pyometra and cystic endometrial hyperplasia, but it decreased the likelihood that they would get endometrial carcinoma and ovarian cancer. When we looked at this though, this high incidence of endometrial carcinoma, ovarian carcinoma, mammary carcinoma, it appeared to be unrelated to MGA, but it resembled remarkably the, the situation we see in women with BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations. And Linda saw this 25 years ago, and she said, hey Agnew, you need to do something about this. So finally, <laughs> about what, five years ago, I had a graduate student, I said, hey, Sarah, you gotta do something about this. <laughs> and Sarah Corner proceeded to get a PhD working on just this problem. 
and found some really interesting results, which I won't, uh, I won't uh, steal too much of her data, but she's done a lot of genetic work here to show that there is some potential. It's not BRCA1 or BRCA2, but it may be involved in similar genes here that might be involved. But how that involves wild populations, how it involves other populations, there's still a ton of work to be done there. Um, we also looked at lyomyomas in big cats, smooth muscle tumors. These are called fibroids in human medicine, which is just an appalling term, and we'll refuse to use that uh, from now on. But these lyomyomas in humans and in um, the canine literature, these are associated with contraception. And yet we did an early study, and Linda did this study, and showed that there was no association in big cats with MGA and lyomyomas. And so with much trepidation, those of you who know Linda, knows that uh, if, she, if she's watching, she would slap me in the back of the head. Um, so I'm hoping that she is tolerant of my work here. But we went and reanalyzed that. But we also reanalyzed it because we have since collected another three times that many tissues from other lions, tigers, leopards, et cetera. And we looked at the data here. And when you looked at leopards, it was just as Linda predicted. If you looked at snow leopards, just as she predicted. Tigers, you looked at just how it, she predicted. But if you look at lions, if you separate out the big cats, all of a sudden lions are very different. Lion, lyomyomas are very associated. There's a very strong correlation between that and, 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 uh, and contraceptive. And if you think about it, again, this is something some next PhD needs to work on here. If you look at the social structure of lions versus the social structure of snow leopards, there's probably a lot more complicated hormonal signaling going on in these animals. African wild dogs are my current uh, passion or, um, or I guess, we're not, actually we're not supposed to call them wild dogs. I should change this. They're now called African painted dogs because it used to be African hunting dogs. Nobody wants a hunting dog around your cows, so they would shoot them. Then we had wild dogs. Who wants a wild dog? So you'd shoot them. So now they're painted dogs. Doesn't everybody want a painted dog in your yard? So they're painted dogs, so they're cool, so we don't kill them, right? But they are endangered, so we're working with them. They have a very interesting, and if you look over here, let me see if I can make a pointer do something. Yep, right there. So it's got endometrial hyperplasia going on here, here it has ruptured through. And so we were seeing a huge number of these uh, wild dogs, painted dogs, um, rupturing their uterus. And so we're seeing that amazing cystic endometrial hyperplasia, pyometra that we would expect um, in these animals. But we're also seeing adenomyosis. And not just you know a little bit of adenomyosis, but like blow a hole in your uterus adenomyosis. And so this stuff is, is it, and they're responding again very differently than dogs or other canids. And so there's some interesting questions to look at here. So we're working on a study now to actually pull out um, and do some RNA-seq to look at the, the genetic signaling in them versus other species. Another uh, cool little quickie here on African painted dogs, they also develop these tumors along their back. And these tumors are apocrine glands. They're African glands that develop along the dorsal back line. And uh, if you look at, they, they have some sebaceous uh, differentiation sometimes, but they can get really nasty. And here's some one with desmoplasia. They can metastasize all over. They can, kill, um, they can kill African wild dogs as well. When we do estrogen receptor, no, nothing going on there, but they are progesterone receptor and they're HER2 positive. So there's definitely some hormonal signaling going on here. What the heck's going on with glands along the dorsal back line? Well, if you look natural history, wild dogs or painted dogs are always, you know, when they're, when they're horny, they're rubbing on everything and they are wiping their pheromones on everything they can. These are reproductive organs. And so there is a reproductive pathology link here. So right now we're looking to see if we can associate that with contraception, with other hormonal imbalances that we might see. And certainly, this is a disease we have created in captivity because when we look in the wild, you know, we don't always, you know, unfortunately, comparing to the wild is a challenge because what happens to an African painted dog when it dies in the wild? Well, the buzzards inspect it carefully, but we don't. So um, from those that have been looked at, no skin tumors ever diagnosed in two fairly large studies for a wildlife study. 
And then back to Deslorella, and I talked a little bit about it, but again, these, the significant concern with these is really just a return to fertility. And so that's gonna be a much more subtle, much more difficult study because we're gonna to have to be looking at what's going on in the pituitary, what's shutting off, why is it not turning back on again? So some interesting questions there. So when we talk about contraception, the usual question is, all right, so all your drugs aren't working, what about abstinence, right? Okay, so let's talk about abstinence. Interestingly, recent evidence suggests that we have a similar risk the cystic endometrial hyperplasia and pyometra in, in the, these wild animals as if they were contraceptive. And it's, if, you, if they don't breed, their corpora lutea are contraceptives. They are pumping the progesterone into that animal. And if they are not being bred, they are not having what I call that cleansing effect of pregnancy. Pregnancy is a great remodeler Pregnancy and birth and involution are incredible remodelers of the uterus and essentially required for complete uterine health. And if you don't do that, then you're at risk. And so there's been all kinds of fancy words in the literature these days of evolutionary mismatch. These are animals that are not essentially doing, following their evolutionary prerogative of being pregnant all the time um, or asymmetric reproductive aging. And so these animals end up with just as significant cystic endometrial hyperplasia. And so we started to look at this and there was a conference actually at AZA called Use It or Lose It. And so they are becoming keenly aware of this and this flies completely in the face of my earlier prerogative of letting those animals age as long as they possibly can without breeding to maintain that genetic diversity. This is telling you, if you wanna maintain a, a fertile population, you need to breed them early and often and that's the only way you're gonna maintain it. So somewhere in between, we need to work out some uh, variations. So no perfect contraceptive, right? Well, there are some things on the horizon. I'm not still expecting perfection, but there's some interesting options. And what I like actually is in honor of the Me Too generation, we're hitting them boys now. So sperm vaccines, GNRH uh, vaccines that actually are working effectively in males bisdiamines, gossy pole, been used for a long time accidentally, right, to induce infertility in people who eat too many soybeans. Uh, Indazole carboxylic acids. Again, a lot of these are being used. They're being looked at as human, um, as, as human contraceptives. Um, and so we're trying to jump on the bandwagon there and we're, you know, offering, we're offering to borrow their data and apply it in our you know, our pharmaceutical research model, which seems to be much faster. <laughs> but the very latest and greatest retro idea, those of you who remember Marius the giraffe from Copenhagen, uh, he's the guy that uh, got euthanized and fed to the lions in Copenhagen. And I find this really interesting because I feel honored to have bookended this, in that this is how I started my zoo career with dead tigers and dead hoofstock. And now here we are back to that very same idea. And the Europeans just are not as appalled as Americans are by this. And, I, and, I, and if you stop and think about it, you look at their perspective. The Europeans are appalled at Americans because what the heck are you guys doing inducing cancer and uterine disease and all of these horrible diseases and interfering with their natural behaviors and interfering with their natural history. This is so much more humane when you think about it. In the wild, 90% neonatal mortality in most hoofstock species with maybe a 10% survival rate. That's normal, that's natural. In the zoo, 90% survival of babies and 10% death rate. So they are just going back to what naturally happens. And instead, we don't have predators in zoos. Instead, we have zookeepers and veterinarians who have to take on that role as the predator and remove that 90%. So how inhumane is that if it's done humanely? So I'm not answering the question, I'm just asking them. Anyway, it's an interesting question, but we're actually looking and we've got an archive, we've got resources to look at all of these. So um, this, is, this is the current status. I, I'm, I'm pleased to say that Linda gave me a lot of uteruses, but I think I've at least doubled the number that she gave me. And we continue to collect these and keep them in an archive for potential research, 
these are all of the different species that we have here of, uh, of different, uh, different creatures that we can look at and study. And essentially, it's so much work to do, we're essentially given the hot button issues to look at. Okay, we've got a problem in African wild dogs. Take a look at it. We'll pull all of them out of the archive and work with it. We also work with other pathologists out in practice who have other samples that we can work with. Um, but essentially, it's very important to maintain an archive like this because in the zoo world, if we decide, you know what, we got a big problem with lemurs. It'll take us 15 years to collect enough lemur tissue to do anything, to actually study anything. But I've already got 25 years worth of lemur stuff right here ready to go. So it's really a powerful tool for the zoo community. But any of you working on NIH grants or other grants realize archives ain't sexy, even if it's a reproductive archive. And it's really, really hard to fund these kinds of activities, archiving activities, without a specific hypothesis in mind. But we've got some new techniques we're working with. So we've developed an endometrial biopsy technique, just like doing it on a cow, but we're doing it in dogs. And we started with a beagle project just to see if it could be done. Now we're doing it in fennec foxes. We've done it in a panda. We've done it in some other species. So it's a really effective way with some caveats. You need to be more careful about when you do it in their cycle. You actually need to understand the reproductive physiology before you go sticking um, instruments into the uterus. But it's a really effective tool to monitor over time the same uterus. And so that can be a really effective um, effective tool. The downside of this project is that we published the Beagle work and now I get phone calls from dog breeders all the time. And I'm like, no, I did this for the wild dogs. I did not do this for the Basset Hounds. Um, but uh, it, it does pay the bills. So um, polar bears, we've been starting some new projects with polar bears looking at other, other issues. The polar bears are also a recent project because again, when I started out, polar bears were not endangered. In fact, they were a pest species in part of the Arctic. All of a sudden, climate warming and the Arctic is going away, as are the polar bears. So they are critically endangered now and unfortunately not breeding well in captivity. So lots of interesting questions there with very, um, you know, with, with, with very uh, uh, important outcomes, hopefully, to those. So I hope to rise to the challenges here. Um, and uh, I always thanks. Thanks to my mule and my family, no other way around, right? For the, their perspective and their wisdom. Um, and so uh, everybody needs to have a mule at home because whenever I go home, she looks at me. She's had so much experience in the world and so much wisdom. She looks at me and she would say, you know, I've seen people who are a lot stupider than you. I said, oh. And she says, but I've seen a lot of people who are smarter too. And so she puts things in perspective for me. So anyway, I've got a few minutes for questions here. So this is uh, recent. This was actually not a recent trip, but this was a trip a while back that I had in Australia. So only in Australia would you see something like this, right? Anyway, so if anybody's got any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. Sure. Hello. So, I was wondering, you know how for a woman if she trying to get pregnant, she kind of monitors her ovulation cycle. Is it possible to not get any drugs and take her in captivity and you can kind of control where they are, monitor their, I don't know what, how their estrogen cycle goes, no. but separate them when they can get pregnant or they lose that ovulation and then <laughs> once that time passes, put them back. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm the parent of a teenage daughter, and <laughs> I'm not. I, I guess I've heard enough horror stories about the difficulties in actually timing that so precisely that you can separate at the appropriate time. But um, we've done we and actually that is probably one of the most common uh, ways now, and that's kind of where I throw it into the abstinence uh, area. And so yes, we can control with select separation, which does help because the animals are together. But there are some species that will cycle continually if they're not bred. And so that's bad. And we have other species which, you know, like the big cats, you can separate them, but it's actually the pregnancy and the, and the parturition and the involution which preserves the animal's health. 
And so they really need to be pregnant in order to maintain that uterine health. So if you wanna maintain a healthy uterus, somehow or another pregnancy needs to fit into the equation at some point in that animal's life. And so we've ended up with kind of a compromise that we can use contraceptives or separation for a couple of years, then you gotta let them get pregnant and have that remodeling. And then you can do it another couple of years and then they can get pregnant and remodel. And I'm really generalizing because we have very specific protocols for almost every species because it's kind of worked out now mostly through trial and error as to what works and what doesn't. So, good question, yeah. Well, you know, and, and abortion is, it, we, we discussed that. Can you abort the animal? And is that more palatable to the public if we're aborting an animal than <laughs> killing its babies, right? Oh, I know, and, and, but we have discussed it and we've talked about it and there are very effective drugs that could do that. The downside is that if anybody who's in, been in cattle practice or who works regularly with cattle, we know that retained placenta is like three times as likely in an abortion. And it's very similar conditions in a lot of other species where appropriate involution only occurs after the full extent of pregnancy. And so, you know, it's, it's something that we're considering and probably it would have some of the beneficial effects, but there are risks associated with that as well. Yes, yeah, so recovery is an issue, et cetera, yep. Question? Going back two decades, we would have cats who would be engaged in abortion if the contact was stimulation. And given the right tool, the cat did it usually, or also the owner did. Yes. With that type of, I know, handling, and do animals become as tissue, but it is possible to keep and secure the animal well, but they still end up with the chronic progesterone because they are chronically exposed to progesterone during that non-pregnant stage. So they, they are exposed to progesterone because it maintains pregnancy, but particularly in canids and felids, they will have a CL and essentially a pseudo-pregnant state throughout that, that diestrous period. And they have a fairly prolonged diestrous period whether they're pregnant or not. And so they still have a very high dose of progesterone and very likely to get cystic endometrial hyperplasia and pyometra if they're not bred. So again, it's that, it's that darn pregnancy which is really required for uterine health. And I have not found a way around that yet. And so yes, you can make the owners happy and the cat happy, but ultimately the uterine health is gonna deteriorate over multiple cycles if you just, um, if they don't actually breed and get pregnant. If they just breed, it might have them ovulate, but as soon as they ovulate, that creates a CL, and that CL stays long enough to produce progesterone for a long period of time. I would assume that actually, where you put a sterile male in with it. Yeah, I know, but again, she's not pregnant. Could you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, okay, good. So the question is, you know, why, you know, we know that w you can use a rod, for instance, to, to induce ovulation in a cat, and would that not um, prevent the repeated cycles, et cetera? And so the answer is yes, it would, it would prevent them from continuing in that estrus state, but it would induce ovulation, and ovulation would be followed by a CL with progesterone, which would be essentially a, over the, a long course of time, a toxic dose of progesterone to the uterus. And so you end up with the same cystic endometrial hyperplasia and pyometra. Oftentimes it is, yes, yeah. And even if it's not, it's long enough. Question? Yes, I have a question from Colombia. Okay. Are the symptoms of the blood related to the hepatitis or genetic drugs? Yeah, fabulous question. So yes, they look very much like hepatoid. Oh, the question is, do these do the tumors that we see in the on the backs of these African painted dogs are they similar to hepatoid tumors which we see regularly in in dogs? And I would say yes, emphatically, they are look very very similar. They behave very similarly. Um, in that they are hormonally driven, so the hepatoid tumors are hormonally driven as well, 
uh, though you can see them in non-hormonally active animals, male castrates, et cetera. But um, different in the location, because dogs don't actually have a gland on their, between their axilla, whereas wild dogs do. And wild dogs do it to exude pheromones out of the, the, their back, whereas dogs exude their pheromones out their perineum. So it's just a slightly different location. And interestingly, um, we haven't worked through all of the data, but it appears we see these tumors very commonly in females, and we think that probably associated with contraception. One more, one more question. Go ahead. So you were talking at the end of your, uh, about um, the use of biopsies, the injection of biopsies. Have you performed or is anyone performing the technology or planning to perform the technology? Um, so the question is, uh, we talked about biopsies. Is anybody doing vaginal cytologies? And so absolutely, we're doing vaginal cytologies um, on, these, on, on a lot of these animals. In fact, most zoos are now training their animals. Um, uh, Potter Park Zoo recently actually trained one of their female snow leopards to back up to the bars and be artificially inseminated. And so if you can do that, you can certainly do a, a vaginal scraping and get cells. And so that's uh, becoming fairly common to do that, and you can do that very routinely. The biopsies require usually general anesthesia in order to do that. Um, it only gives you information as to how they're cycling, just like we would have in a dog or a cat. You know, you can do that vaginal cytology. It does not give you a really good idea of what kind of pathology you might have going on inside the uterus, but it would tell you whether the animal's an estrus or diestrus or anestrus. So important questions on cycling, maybe timing. Um, that's a tool that we can use. And, and what I love about the zoo world is that back when I did it, we used to have to wrestle everything or use, use narcotics to knock them down or whatever. We were not supposed to use the term knock down, but that's what we did. We knocked them down. Um, but, uh, but nowadays, the, the use of operant conditioning and training, almost everything you could imagine they can do. I mean, they're, they're doing, you know, I was just talking to the Detroit Zoo veterinarians a couple days ago, and they're now doing uh, awake blood draws from their polar bears. And I can't imagine anything scarier than that. When I have nightmares, it's about polar bears because I know how vicious and intelligent they are. So they're, they're able to do that. So that's pretty amazing. So they're, they're, and they're doing vaginal cytologies on polar bears which is the safer end of a polar bear to mess with. <laughs> Stinkier, but safer, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, thank appreciate you, it. Yeah. Last speaker, and before we um, go to our last talk, I would like to thank again the members of the uh. leadership, um, Dr. Francisco Sal, Dr. Ana Alcaraz, Dr. Inga Dalmor, um, Francisco Carvalho, and Paola Barato for setting up the connections so others can attend the presentations as well. There we go.